Hey, greetings everybody, GleeCon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. <clears throat> On our last episode, we saw Thrall, um, who had just recently been recaptured and placed in an Orcish internment camp. Um, the, the orcs there kind of were like, eh, we don't have it in us to, to like, rise up, but we'll create a distraction for you to escape. And Taratha was discovered by Lord Blackmore as being the one who helped Thrall escape, and things are going to be bad for her. So stay a while and listen to Chapter 9. <clears throat> we'll see kind of what order. Do we do we take a diversion and we start pursuing Thrall's line, or do we get right into how horrific it's about to become for Taratha? <clears throat> this is Chapter 9, Day of... No, no, not Day. Lord of the Clans. Thrall had never been so exhausted or hungry in his life. But freedom tasted sweeter than the meat he had been fed and felt more restful than the straw upon which he had slept as Blackmore's prisoner at Durnhold. He was unable to catch the conies and squirrels that flitted through the forest and wished that somehow survival skills had been taught to him along with battle histories and the nature of art. Because it was autumn, there were ripe fruits on the trees and he quickly became adept at finding grubs and insects. These did little to appease the mammoth hunger that gnawed at his insides, but at least he had ready access to water in the form of the myriad small streams and brooks that wound through the forest. <clears throat> After several days, the wind shifted while Thrall steadily pushed through the undergrowth and brought the sweet scent of roasting meat to his nostrils. He inhaled deeply as if he could obtain sustenance by the smell alone. Ravenous, he turned to follow the smell. Even though his body was crying out for food, Thrall did not let his hunger overcome his caution. That was well, for as he moved to the edge of the forested area, he saw dozens of humans. The day was bright and warm, one of the last few such days of the fall, and the humans were joyfully preparing a feast that made Thrall's mouth water. There were baked breads, barrels of fit, fresh fruits and vegetables, crocks of jams and butters and spreads, wheels of cheeses, bottles of what he assumed were wine and mead, and in the center... Two pigs turned slowly on spits. Thrall's knees gave way and he sank slowly to the forest floor, staring enraptured at the foodstuffs spread before him as if to taunt him. Over in the cleared field, children played with hoops and banners and other toys Thrall could not attach names to. Mothers suckled their babes and maidens danced shyly with young men. It was a scene of happiness and contentment and more than the food Thrall wanted to belong here. <clears throat> But he did not. He was an orc, a monster, a green skin, a black blood, and any of a hundred other epithets. So he sat and watched while the villagers celebrated, feasted, and danced until the night encroached upon them. The moons rose, one bright and white, one cool and blue-green, as the last of the furniture, plates, and food items were gathered up. Thrall watched the villagers wander down the winding path through the field and saw small candles appear in tiny windows. Still he waited and watched the moons move slowly across the sky. Many hours after the last candle was extinguished in the windows, Thrall rose, moved with skillful silence toward the village. His sense of smell had always been acute, and it was sharpened now that he was giving it leave to enjoy the smells of food. He followed the scents, reaching into windows and snatching whole loaves of bread, which he gobbled down at once, uncovering a basket of apples set out by the door and crunching the small sweet fruits greedily. Juice ran down his bare chest, sweet and sticky. He absently wiped at it with one large green hand. Slowly, the hunger was beginning to be sated. At each house, Thrall took something, but never too much from any one home. At one window, Thrall peered in to see figures sleeping by the dying hearth fire. He quickly withdrew, waited a moment, and then slowly looked in again. These were children, sleeping on straw mattresses. There were three of them, plus one in a cradle. Two were boys, the third was a little girl with yellow hair. As Thrall watched, she rolled over in her sleep. A sharp pang stabbed Thrall. As if no time at all had passed, he was transported in his mind back to that day when he had first seen Taratha, when she had smiled broadly and waved at him. This girl looked so much like her, with her round cheeks, her golden hair. A harsh noise startled him, and Thrall whirled just in time to see something four-legged and dark charge at him. Teeth snapped near his ear. Reacting instinctively, Thrall clutched the animal and closed his hands around the beast's throat. Was this a wolf, one of the creatures his people sometimes befriended? <clears throat> it had erect pointed ears, a long muzzle, and sharp white teeth. It resembled the woodcuts of wolves he had seen in the books, but was very different in coloring and head shape. 
Now the house was awake and he heard human voices crying in alarm. He squeezed and the creature went limp. Dropping the body, Thrall looked inside to see the little girl staring at him with eyes wide in horror. As he watched, she screamed and pointed, Monster! Monster! The hateful words coming from her innocent lips wounded Thrall to the quick. He turned to flee, only to see that a ring of frightened villagers surrounded him. Some of them carried pitchforks and scythes, the only weapons this farming community possessed. I mean you no harm, Thrall began. It talks! It's a demon! screamed someone, and the little band charged. Thrall reacted instinctively, and his training kicked in. When one of the men shoved a pitchfork at him, Thrall deftly seized the makeshift weapon and used it to knock the other forks and scythes out of the clumsy villagers' hands. At one point he screamed his battle cry, the bloodlust high within him, and swung the pitchfork at his attackers. He stopped just short of impaling the fallen man who stared up at him wildly. These men were not his enemies, even though it was clear they feared and hated him. They were simple farmers, living off the crops they grew and the animals they raised. They had children. They were afraid of him, that was all. No, the enemy was not here. The enemy was sleeping soundly on a feather bed in Durnhold. With a cry of self-loathing, Thrall hurled the pitchfork several yards away and took advantage of the break in the circle to flee for the safety of the forest. The men did not pursue. Thrall had not expected them to. They only wished to be left in peace. As he ran through the forest, utilizing the energy engendered by the confrontation to his advantage, Thrall tried and failed to erase the image of a little blonde girl screaming in terror and calling him Monster. <clears throat> The vignette there. It's tail chewing time, guys. Thrall ran through the next day and into the night when he finally collapsed in exhaustion. He slept the sleep of the dead with no dreams to plague him. Something roused him before the dawn and he blinked sleepily. There came a second sharp prod to the belly and now he was fully awake and staring up at eight angry orc faces. He tried to rise, but they fell upon him and bound him before he could even struggle. One of them shoved a large, angry face with yellowed tusks within an inch of Thrall's. He barked something completely unintelligible, and Thrall shook his head. The orc frowned even more terribly, grabbed one of Thrall's ears, and uttered more gibberish. Guessing at what the other might be saying, Thrall said in the human tongue, No, I'm not deaf. An angry hiss came from all of them. You man, said the big orc, who seemed to be their leader. You not speak orcish. A little, Thrall said in that language. My name is Thrall. The orc gaped, then opened his mouth and guffawed. His cronies joined him. Human, who looks like an orc, he said, extending a black-nailed finger in Thrall's direction. In orcish, he said, Kill him. No, Thrall cried in orcish. One thing about this fairly dire encounter gave him hope. These orcs were fighters. They did not slouch about in exhausted despair, too dispirited to even climb an easily scalable stone wall. One fine Gromash Hellscream! The big orc froze. In broken human, he said, Why fight? You said to kill, huh? From human, huh? Thrall shook his head. No. Camp's bad. Orcs. He couldn't find the words in his alien tongue. So he sighed deeply and hung his head, trying to look like the pitiable creatures he had met in the internment camp. Me want orcs. He lifted his roped hands and bellowed. Rah! Ramesh, help. No more camps. No more orcs. Again, he mimed, looking despondent and hopeless. He, he risked a look up, wondering if his broken orcish had managed to convey what he wanted. Well, at least they weren't trying to kill him anymore. Another orc, slightly smaller but equally as dangerous looking as the first, spoke in a gruff voice. The leader responded heatedly. They argued back and forth, and then finally the big one seemed to give in. Drag say maybe. Maybe you should he held scream. If you were thee, come. They hauled him to his feet and marched him forward. The prod of the spear in his back encouraged Thrall to pick up the pace. Even though he was bound and at the center of a ring of hostile orcs, Thrall felt a surge of joy. He was going to see Gromash hell scream, the one orc that remained uncowed. Perhaps together they could free the imprisoned orcs, rouse them into action, and remind them of their birthrights. While it was difficult for Thrall to summon many words of orc speech, he was able to understand much more than he could articulate. He remained quiet and listened. <clears throat> the orcs escorting him to see Hellscream were surprised by his vigor. Thrall had noticed that most of them had brown or black eyes, not the peculiar burning red of most of the orcs in the internment camps. Kelgar had indicated that there might be some kind of connection between the glowing, fiery orbs 
and the peculiar lethargy that had all but overcome the orcs. What it was, Thrall didn't know, and by listening he hoped to learn. <clears throat> While the orcs had nothing of glowing red eyes, they did comment on the listlessness. Many of the words that Thrall did not understand were nonetheless comprehensible because of the tone of contempt in which they were uttered. Thrall was not alone in his revulsion and disgust at seeing the once legendary fighting force brought lower than common cattle. At least a bull would charge you if you irritated it. Of their great warlord, they spoke words of praise and awe. They also spoke of Thrall, wondering if he was some sort of new spy sent to discover Gromash's lair and lead the humans to a cowardly ambush. Thrall desperately wished there were some way to convince them of his sincerity. He would do anything they wanted of him to prove himself. At one point, the group came to a halt. The leader whom Thrall had learned was named Rekshak, untied a sash from around his broad chest. He held it in both hands and went to Thrall. You be, he said something in Orcish that Thrall didn't understand, but he knew what Rekshak wanted. He lowered his head obediently, for he towered over all the other orcs and permitted himself to be blindfolded. The sash smelled of new sweat and old blood. Certainly they might kill him now, or abandon him to die, bound and blindfolded. Thrall accepted that possibility and thought it preferable to another day, spent risking his life in the gladiator pit for the glory of the cruel bastard who had beaten him and tried to break Tari's spirit. Now he strode with less certain steps, though at one point two orcs silently went to either side of him and grasped his arms. He trusted them. He had no choice. With no way to gauge the passing of time, the journey seemed to take forever. At one point the soft, springy forest loam gave way to chill stone and the air around Thrall turned colder. By the way, the other orcs' voices were altered, Thrall realized they were descending into the earth. At last they came to a halt. Thrall bowed his head and the sash was removed. Even the dim light provided by torches made him blink as his eyes adjusted from the utter darkness of the blindfold. He was in an enormous underground cavern. Sharp stones thrust from both stone ceiling and floor. Thrall could hear the drip of moisture in the distance. There were several smaller caves leading out from this one large cavern, many with animal skins draped over the entrances. Armor that had seen better days and weapons that looked well used and well cared for were scattered here and there. A small fire burned in the center, its smoke wafting up to the stone roof. This, then, must be where the legendary Gromash Hellscream and the remnants of the once fierce Warsong clan had retreated. But where was the famous chieftain? Thrall looked around. While several more orcs had emerged from various caves, none had the bearing or garb of a true chieftain. He turned to Rekshak. You said you would take me to Hellscream, he demanded. I do not see him here. <clears throat> you do not see him, but he is present. He sees you, said another orc, brushing aside an animal skin and emerging into the cavern. This one was almost as tall as Thrall, but without the bulk. He looked older and very tired. The bones of various animals, and quite possibly humans, were strung on a necklace about his thin throat. He carried himself in a manner that demanded respect, and Thrall was willing to give it. Whoever this orc was, he was a personage of importance in the clan, and it was clear he spoke the human tongue almost as fluently as Thrall. Thrall inclined his head. This may be, but I wish to speak with him, not merely bask in his unseen presence. The orc smiled. You have spirit, fire, he said. That is well. I am Iskar, advisor to the great chieftain Hellscream. My name is... You are not unknown to us, Thrall of Durnhol. At Thrall's look of surprise, Iskar continued. Many have heard of Lieutenant General Blackmore's pet orc. Thrall growled softly deep in his throat, but he did not lose his composure. He had heard the term before, but it rankled more coming from the mouth of one of his own people. We have never seen you fight, of course, Iskar continued, clasping his hands behind his back and walking a slow circle around Thrall, looking him up and down all the while. Walks aren't allowed to watch the gladiator battles. While you were finding glory in the ring, your brethren were beaten and abused. Thrall could take it no longer. I've received none of the glory. I was a slave, owned by Blackmoor. And if you do not think I despise him, look at this. He twisted around so they could see his back. They looked, and then to his fury they laughed. There is nothing to see, Thrall of Durnhold, Iskar said. Thrall realized what had happened. The healing cell had worked its magic all too well. There was not even a scar on his back from the terrible beating he had received from Blackmore and all of his men. You all asked for our compassion, and yet you seem hale and healthy to us. Thrall whirled. Anger filled him, and he tried to temper it, but to little avail. I was a thing, a piece of property, 
Do you think I benefited from my sweat and blood shed in the ring? Blackmore hauled in gold coins while I was kept in a cell brought out for his amusement. The scars on my body are not visible, I realize that now. But the only reason I was healed was so that I could go back in the ring and fight again to enrich my master. There are scars you cannot see that run much deeper. I escaped. I was thrown into the camps, and then I came here to find Hellscream. Although I begin to doubt his existence, it seems too much to hope for that I could still find an orc who exemplifies all that I understood our people to be. <clears throat> what do you understand our people to be, then? Orc who bears the name of a slave, Iskar taunted. Thrall was breathing heavily, but summoned the control that Sargent had taught him. They are strong, cunning, powerful. They are a terror in battle. They have spirits that cannot be quenched. Let me see Hell scream, and he will know that I am worthy. We will be the judge of that, said Iskar. He raised his hand, and three orcs entered the cavern. They began to don armor and reach for various weapons. These three are our finest warriors. They are, as you have said, strong, cunning, and powerful. They fight to kill or die, unlike what you are used to in the gladiator ring. Your play-acting will not serve you here. Only real skill will save you. If you survive, Hellscream may grant you an audience, or he may not. Thrall gazed at Iskar. He will see me, he said confidently. You had best hope so. Begin! And with no further warning, all three orcs charged at the weaponless, armorless Thrall. It's kind of cool, actually. I, be, I feel like that would be a fun scene in, like, a movie or something. All right, so he's finally starting to get in with his people, answered the question we had set up at the beginning of this chapter. we got another episode in the pipe, 5x5, five five, and I look forward to seeing the next one with everybody. See you guys next time on Lore of Warcraft.